You're listening to the Racer to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm your co-host, Aaron Mack. The other co-host, you may have seen walking out of Barber Lounge 459 with a big <laughs> old smile on his face. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. He is the one and only Mr. Scott Bowie. Hello, Aaron. How's it How going? Are you? I'm doing I'm good. good. So we just recorded an interview that we'll be releasing um, in a few weeks. Um, so if you are watching it now or listening and you listened to the one from last week, we did make a, a false We lied claim. to you. We lied. We absolutely lied. We said that Jock Lazier was going to be the um, our interview for this week. And Jock will be actually next week now. So we got the interview, Brandy Lanier, um, didn't know exactly where we were going to get it. And it worked out. We got it last week and his book is actually coming out next week. So we wanted to release it, um, you know, good timing with the book. Um, So it's going to be released a few days before the book is. So we figured that would be the best time so we can kind of help promote the book. Um, So that's why we're releasing Randy this week. And um, Jock was here the next week, but everyone will really enjoy the Randy Lanier interview. If you've ever, if you haven't and you have Netflix, please go to Netflix and look up um, his the documentary. It's part of the Bat Sports series on Netflix, and it's called Need for Weed. Um, and it's, I mean, you know, everyone says this, but it's one of the craziest stories in sports for sure. Yeah, it absolutely is. And, and Randy, uh, man, you know, and Randy wasn't the only one. There was several others in, in motorsport and all parts of the world, um, all walks of life who were selling a lot of marijuana in the early eighties. Uh, and Randy, uh, Randy was just very proficient at it and he sold lots and lots of it. And, uh, he talked a little bit about on here talked a lot about it. Or I should say a lot. He talked somewhat about his, the time he spent in jail. Mm. Uh, he talked about, um, how he had to use his mind to overcome a lot of things while he was in jail. Cause it was, you know, it's, you know, it's hard time, you know? Um, and, uh, it just, uh, you know, in some ways it's, uh, it's a story of redemption in other ways. It's a story of, of getting, getting what you get, you know, I mean, you, you sell a lot of drugs and, and, you know, chances are you're going to get caught and uh, he did get caught. He has paid a major price for that. And uh, so it's, it's been, it was really great talking to him. Uh, It's interesting talking to him. It's amazing how uh, you can tell talking to him today, how grateful he is to be out because he never thought he was going to get out for years and years and years. And um, so it, it was, it was a great interview. Uh, Aaron, I believe you have a copy of the book and, uh, it is, uh, Aaron read the entire book in a day and a half. I did about a day and a half. And I, I remembered actually how to read because I don't think I've read a book since probably, <laughs> probably like high school or college. I mean, I didn't really, my, my major in college wasn't anything where I had to like really read a lot. So I didn't, I don't think I ever read a full book in college probably, but in high school, I definitely did a couple of times, few times. Um, and I just did about 15 years later. So thank you to Randy for sending me a book. And yeah, I read the entire book and it's, um, it was, and it, it, it was a book where it was hard for me just to stop. It's like Ben's Watson and Netflix documentary. I just kept reading and reading and, um, it's a great read. And if someone who has read a book for 15 years, um, just, just reads it, the entire book in a day and a half, that means it's pretty good. So, um, Check it out. Survival of the Fastest is available on Amazon. Um, and I think Randy said Barnes and Noble bookstores as well. And they're going to try to do uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. If you live yep. in Indianapolis, uh, he's going to try to do something with them there. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it was a in, very interesting talk. And, and like I said, there's some of it that's it's inspirational. And um, yeah there's a little bit of something for everybody in there to be to be honest with you right and i think you know obviously 
you have to overlook some of the legality of some of the stuff. But I mean, regardless, I mean, the guy is very intelligent, very intelligent individual. He puts his mind to something. He can definitely do it. Yeah, that's no doubt. I mean, it is no small feat in what he was doing. I mean, that to do what he was doing and run a, a race team and be the driver. Uh, I, I sure don't know how he did it. Um, yeah, I, I just that, you know, one of those tasks would have been very overwhelming for me. So to do all those at once was pretty impressive on one level. Yeah. And I mean, in the interview, we talked about everything from, you know, kind of him getting a start in racing, how he got interested in racing to, like we said, obviously the drug smuggling stuff a little bit. Indy 500. And the one amazing thing from Indy 500 was every the walls were closing in on him when he finally yeah. got the opportunity to race Indy. And I mean, he was rookie of the year. Yeah. His, his, you know, as his goals were, you know, when all, all the fruit of his labor was coming to fruition, it, it was all ending at the same time. Yeah. Yep. And, um, but yeah, no great interview. Um, one of the favorite stories you'll have, you have to listen to the interview, but he talks about some of his, um, attempted prison break plans. Um, one involved a helicopter. Um, so I, we, we got a kick out of that. And like you say, he's a dreamer. So, um, funny guy. I've had the privilege of getting to meet Randy a couple different times. I've met him in Daytona and I've met him at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Um, he talks about that as well, coming back to Indy after 30 something years. Um, so yeah, real, really fun guy to talk to. And, um, yeah, no, it's, it was a lot of fun for sure. It was, it, it, it was a fun interview. So racing news, um, there's actually been a decent amount of racing news, right? Some crazy stuff. Um, doubleheader Iowa. Yeah. Doubleheader Iowa. Uh, it looked to be the entire weekend was going to be the Joseph Newgarden show. And it definitely was on Saturday. Sunday, something breaks in the right rear. Spins, gets in the fence. He gets out of the car. I mean, he just absolutely dominated the race to that point. And then... Uh, Scary incident for him after being released from the uh, infield care center. Obviously, anybody who follows IndyCar knows that he uh, fainted, passed out, whatever you want to call it, uh, either by the hauler or by, by his bus. Uh, in order to get through traffic, they took him by helicopter to the hospital uh, where he has been released. But Santino Ferrucci is on standby in case... Uh, just new guard cannot race this weekend, um, which is, it's pretty scary to think about. Um, I, I have not personally heard what they think the reason for it was. I mean, you have to assume, you know, some people I'm sure assume it was a crash, although he went through the, the, uh, concussion protocol, uh, you know, the checkups at the infield care center. Um, and then obviously you can maybe point to. Uh, dehydration and which is you know we've all talked about the heat of those race cars since they put the aero screen on so i don't know which it is i know he's been wearing a cool suit uh and he says it's been working perfectly so just have to find out because it's it's very curious what really happened there right and i mean we got to talk about jimmy johnson right i mean yeah very very impressive you know, it, it's kind of, I think it's unfair for him that he has been doing the road courses. I mean, I get why he's doing them, but people are kind of overlooking how good the guy is looking on ovals. Oh, he's great. Looking great on ovals. I mean, man, I mean, he, he was balls. doing, he was doing passes and no one else. I mean, they were saying other drivers were watching his, um, his camera on the onboard yeah. camera. I mean, because he was doing lines and no one else had the guts to do. And I, I would just say that definitely years and years and years of experience of running those type of tracks, because I mean, that's, that's a special at the well, end of the day. Yeah. I mean, Iowa, like he had never raced Iowa, he said, uh, but Iowa is a super fast racetrack right. for it, You're getting around there in 18 seconds. It's like 179 to 180 mile an hour average speed. Uh, so, I mean, that place is fast. 
And uh, while the mile power doesn't sound so great, well, you do it in 18 seconds. It's pretty, pretty amazing. And uh, the, I mean, he is ballsy, man. He, he was slicing and dicing. I mean, he's racing hard. He didn't care who he was racing, whether, you know, which one of his teammates. Right. Um, yeah. Hats off, man. It, it was a hell of a show. He did a hell of a job. Uh, then you got to talk about Pato Award. I mean, he was great both days. Uh, second and a first. And, uh, you know, he's, I think they said the last three double headers, he's won the second race. Oh, so I mean, I, I, I mean, it's, it was something like that. Yeah. And it's, it's, man, they keep, they keep hiring people in the McLaren that go to Formula One. And I think they got their, maybe have their F1 driver sitting right there. <laughs> no, I agree. Um, they well, all the guys I think Zach Brown is promising potential F1 opportunities. He's got enough drivers for the next 15 years, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, he's I mean, got enough, to... he's got enough F1 drivers for all the other teams. If any of the other teams right. need a driver, well, they're gonna have to start another, they're, they're gonna have to start a second team at this point. Right. Yeah. That is true. Speaking of Formula One, uh, surprise, surprise, Max Verstappen wins. Again, Charles Leclerc looked like he had that thing well handled early on. Don't know what happened. It's fun. He, you know, he pointed the finger at himself. His team said, well, we got to look at data. You know, we, you could have caught a wind gust. You know, we just don't know what happened. Um, so that left the door open for the two Mercedes to run second and third. And Mercedes... Mercedes is good this year. They just, they aren't great. And you know, it's going to be hard to finish in front of those Ferraris and those Red Bull cars on a constant basis. Oh, absolutely. And NASCAR, we got to definitely talk about NASCAR. Um, man, what, I mean, that's the first time this has happened since what, the 50s, I think someone said. Well, yeah, they, they, so, but they said they were going to take wins away. I mean, they, it isn't like it wasn't known. Um, and, you know, they found underneath the body, you know, underneath the, the body wrap, they found uh, pieces of tape, I guess, from what I was told, that uh, helped create downforce. I was Denny Hamlin well, and Kyle Busch. Right. Denny Hamlin and Kyle Busch to help, uh, you know, with aerodynamics. And um, they got caught. So I don't know what the full fall ought to be. Obviously, they, they took away the win. They took away the second place. I don't know what kind of fines come along after that, uh, but that that was a big blow to him. That really hurt him. Yeah, no, it it definitely did, and you know they. I know the team communicated something and said that you know there was a miscommunication among the team on with a body worker or something. Maybe it was. It seems a little weird, but hey, man, no, they they, am... they communicated to hide it a little bit better. I am just waiting for our good buddy Dave Lane to release a video on him because I'm sure it's coming. I, he's got a lot of topics right now. Yeah. He, he's you know he's he's going to be making a lot of videos at this point because uh, I haven't seen anything following up from Iowa about Joseph Newgarden, uh, but I'm sure he'll have something from that. I think, I think he did release that one. I think he did on race two. So well, no, I'm talking about oh, since yeah. right. since Newgarden had his issue. Um, so he hasn't, to my knowledge, released anything on that yet. And I'm sure he'll release, uh, some sort of NASCAR video because those NASCAR videos, he does do very well. If you look at his views, so I'm sure he'll have to say something about it. Uh, but yeah, no, it, it's in one hand, you, you, it sucks because, you know, you're just trying to gain an advantage, but it's in the rules and they, they told him, you know, we, we catch you cheating. You're going to get, lose the wins. Absolutely. And I, I was happy in, to hear that um, David officially has his air conditioning back. He actually gave me a oh, shout Debbie. out. He gave me a shout right. out in that um, Alex Blue video well, a couple weeks ago. I forgot, I forgot to mention in the last our last podcast, but um, yeah, he, he has yeah. his air back. And if, if you look at Scott right now, he's Scott is very comfortable. He is very cool. And why are you so comfortable and cool, Scott? Because the good guys, good guys hanging in there took care of me in my desperate need 
Um, mine went out the same time as David was out. And mine. I, and I do. And I, yeah, and yours went out. And I'm not sure uh, who David used. I'm sure they're fine folks, but I use the fine folks at Good Guys. Uh, Ryan, they come out, put a new unit in, working perfect. It's funny though how my my air went out. I I got my air back. Right when I got my air back, your air went out, and then all of a sudden you tell me your air's back, and then I realize I don't have air anymore. I don't know where my air conditioning went. <laughs> air conditioner <laughs> went. I... I would never steal your air. I know. I'm just air. joking. <laughs> now there are people in your neighborhood who probably would. Not my not neighborhood. Me. Maybe your neighborhood. Not my neighborhood. Definitely my neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot of copper in those things, so just oh, <laughs> just sure. remember that. Sure, uh, a lot of aluminum and copper. Uh, Sprint week started for USAC this week. Unfortunately, they've had two rainouts. Uh, they're running right now at Circle City as we speak. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shane Cottle pulled a last uh, two lap dramatic pass for the win uh, at Gas City. Uh, he is a master at Gas City. Uh, Robert Blue uh, caused a couple or helped cause a couple reds. Um, and it put Coddle in line to where he had a chance to win that race. He passed Justin Grant. Uh, fortunately, the entire event got rained out at Kokomo last night at Lawrenceburg. They got all the way to the main event. They were pushing the program along, and right as they were pushing the cars off, they started to rain. So I don't know if they're rescheduling that. Kokomo is actually rescheduled for. Tomorrow, which would be Wednesday the 26th, um, or, well, <laughs> actually, I should say Tuesday the 26th, sorry, and because today is Monday, and um, that was supposed to be their day off, and so it's, it's scheduled for Tuesday the 26th, um, and then I think Wednesday's uh, Terre Haute, Thursday's Putnamville, I'm not sure what's Friday, uh, but USAC is in full swing with Sprint Week. Um, other than that, I, I don't really have any other racing news. BC 39 is coming up next week. Um, my nephew got his midget motor put back together. So hopefully he will be running that. Uh, Tony Kanan took a few laps in Tim Clausen's car. And if you go to the IMS, uh, website, he talks about it. Uh, he seemed to love running a midget at that track. So, um, People go check that out. I know there's some video as well. I think on YouTube you can find some video. Uh, Tony looked good. Tony Kanan <laughs> would have so. been a Tony <laughs> Kanan would have been an amazing open wheel driver, as would have Helio, as would have a number of those guys. And I, it sucks that they never ran sprint cars and midgets, uh, but that's not the background they come from. But they would have been great at it. Yeah, definitely. And you know, Khan, he's done like the I mean, he did the prelude. It was like the prelude to the dream, right? Right. He's done that. He did the couple of dirt races with SR, SRX. Sure. Yeah. Midget's a lot different. Uh, the prelude, uh, late model, a lot of offset. Uh, those things run. Those things are really great race cars. SRX doesn't have a lot of offset because they they run pavement and dirt both, so they're trying to make it cars neutral. Um. So you can't really hang them out. They, you run more like pavement where the car's a lot straighter. Uh, at the speedway, he was getting a little less in how because it was it rained that day. He was over there, and if you if anybody watches the video, they had to scrape a ton of mud off the track just so he could go out and run. So it was she was pretty juiced up when he was out there, and uh, he got a little taste of what it's like to run a midget. And uh, but like I said, he looked good. Yeah, no, he did. Um, but yeah, definitely big, big weekend coming up. I still mean, I still call the Brickyard, even though it's not right. Um, but you know, NASCAR, IndyCar doubleheader. Yeah, I'll be there. Um, definitely, definitely looking forward to it. Um, yeah, I was watching the inaugural Brickyard 400 the other day. It's just, I understand why they don't race the oval anymore, obviously for NASCAR, but I just remember the tradition behind it. And I have a lot of good memories of 10, 15 years ago just the whole fanfare that the breaker used to bring all of the haulers set up outside. I mean, th- there's a field over there across from um, what Georgetown where they used to be full of sponsor activation tents and all kinds of stuff. Right. Um, and it was just really cool. And 
it, obviously things have changed a lot since then. Um, well, you, you know, you had the economic downturn that hurt. You had the tire debacle, which really, really hurt. It, it really killed NASCAR here, just like it killed F1 here. Um, sure. It really hurt. And, uh, but yeah, the Brickyard was, I mean, the Brickyard at one time, I think you could have made a really strong argument that it was a more popular race amongst fans than the 500 was. Of course, you had Jeff Gordon running. You had Tony Stewart running, Ryan Newman, a lot of Indiana uh, drivers. Uh, so you, you had that going for it. Uh, obviously, Earnhardt Sr. was still running. So it, it obviously it was a different time period. Uh, it's too bad. I, I hate to see that it lost its luster. Um, but they're trying something to, to make it work. And I, I, it was well received last year. Sure. And so I, I, I think it's going to keep going along, um, but you hate to see it not what it once was. Oh, absolutely. Um, so a couple shout outs before we get to the interview. Um, first off, actually our good buddy of the show, Patrick Patton from racercollect.com actually sent me a text before we started the show. Um, he's actually at the Circle City um, Speedway. He asked if we were out there. Well, I would have been, but we had to do some interviews tonight, and that's how life goes. It's my fault. <laughs> no, it's not, it's nobody's fault. It, it is. It just you take them as they come. Um. So yeah. So if you're looking for any racing memorabilia or anything like that, definitely go to racercollect.com. Patrick's a great guy, great friend of the show, like we said. Um. And actually, so one one of the friends of the shows, Mister um, Jagger Jones, is. Coming up with a birthday here on Friday. It's going to be yep. 20. So He'll happy turn really 20 birthday. on Friday. Yep. Happy birthday, Jagger. Uh, yep. Turned 20 years old. Uh, the number one song the day he was born was Hot and Her by Nelly. Oh, wow. So think about that for a second if you want to feel old. What was it? What was the number one song when you, you were born? Oh, I don't know. It'd have been uh it was sixty-nine, June sixty-nine, right in the summer of love. Man, it could have been anything. Um I would say whoever it was probably performed at Woodstock though. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that. Uh, but no, I don't know what was, to be very honest with you. I never looked. That's true. Um, like like we said, um make sure you check out Randy Lanier's new book available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Survival of the Fastest, like I said. I read the entire book over 300 pages in a day and a half. Um, so it's a good read, fun read. Definitely enjoyed it. So please check it out. And if you haven't hit like or subscribe yet, if you're watching on YouTube, please do so. Also check us out on Apple Podcasts and Spotify and anywhere podcasts can be found. Um, here at Race to Race, we're definitely working on some new exciting things. We have a couple of exciting things we're working on this week. So really cool 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 things um and definitely look look forward to sharing those yeah absolutely uh, a lot of fun in the future near future near future that's right well um like we said next week sorry again to disappoint everyone and to lie but jock was here we will be releasing next week and this week is randy lanier and hope everyone enjoys take care everybody our guest today is a 1984 MSA Camel GT champion and the 1986 Indianapolis 500 Rookie of the Year. He is one of the craziest stories in all sports, having a Netflix documentary detailing his life called Bat Sport, Need for Weed. He also has a book being released August 2nd called Survival of the Fastest, Weed Speed in the 1980s, <laughs> Drug Scandal that Shocked the Sports World. We are joined by Randy Lanier. Randy? It's great to have you on. Um, I'm trying to get you on for a little while, so I appreciate you coming on. And um, and thank you so much for sending me the book. And like I said, I actually have read the entire book. Um, All right, cool. In about three days. So, and oh. I, to be completely honest with you, this is probably the last time I read a full book was probably in high school, about 15 years ago, <laughs> so or more than that. Well, I, I, when we wrote it, I, I, we was kind of gearing it to be a fast read and i guess you proved to me that it can be a fast read so thank yeah. you yeah oh absolutely no i absolutely enjoy the book um 
you know, it's re- and I've, I've seen the documentary um, and the book definitely, you know, goes in a lot more detail. Um, yeah. And it, it was, it was a great read, like you were saying. So, and one thing, and I won't give away too much of the book for the people listening, but the one thing that I thought was interesting. So in the, I think it's the prologue, um, you know, you were talking about after you got busted and just having like, you know, f- asking yourself, like, if you had any regrets. And the one thing you said was you, whenever you thought that you always went back to hearing the first Indy 500 when you were a little kid um, on the radio. So, I mean, would you say like, do you think like you would have been busted if it wasn't for like your desire to race in the Indy 500? Like no, I'm the saying racing, it, the, the racing had nothing to do with me getting indicted. Um, right. I, I guess what, where I was going with it was like, obviously to race in the Indy 500 takes a lot of money. So you were upping your, um, ramping up your efforts uh, to make more money is what I was saying. That's where I was yeah. going with that. So the the money that it took to get to the space where I wanted to get was eventually to win the Indy 500. Right. Uh, I found a pathway. And had I not found it in drug smuggling, I would have probably found it some, some other avenue. Because when we really put our attention on goals and stuff, that's how we achieve what it is we want to get done, accomplished. So if you're living with good intentions, you'll get it done. You'll 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 get it across the finish line. But I chose a pathway that it may have been a little bit easier for me to acquire the funding. And I didn't see any other way at the moment, but with hindsight, I could have chose some other avenues. <laughs> And would you say like, I, sorry, Scott, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say there's always junk bonds, pyramid schemes, right? <laughs> there's a lot of different <laughs> ways to earn a lot of money, right? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, starting out uh, doing some SCCA events, I could have just been happy doing that because you're at the racetrack, uh, not spending as much as you do when you step up in the Grand Prix cars or the Indy cars. And, you know, just to be in a car now, look at it, it's a wonderful thing. So, um, you know, it's just each path with, as you go up the ladder with racing is exuberant in cost. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, but so, you know, you talk about going to the um, auto show, you know, going to the SCCA booth, um, getting the brochure, calling the number and, um, you know, t- go, do, going through the SCCA program. Um, and I mean, were you doing all that at that point to for your goal of racing the Indy 500 or was it just to race at that point? At, at that point, it was just to drive the race cars. I, I mm-hmm. wanted to, of course, I, you know, m- most drivers love would love to compete at the Indy 500. Uh, the more your passion grows for it, uh, to be the best version of yourself, you want to compete against the best drivers in the world. and. Uh, drive the fastest cars at least that's how my thinking was so but when I first started out my goals were just being at a racetrack being in a race car experiencing that and and really digging on that and at what point would you say you realized that you had that you were good and you had a pretty good chance of um you know kind of turning into a pro racer uh I don't know if it was just uh I don't know if you say at any point um as I went in, just even getting my competition license, I kind of told myself that I can get this done and be good at it. Uh, but the thing about being good is you want to be better each lap if you can. And you're always chasing a better lap. There's no perfect lap. There's not no even track records. There's no perfect lap. And you're always trying to hit hit your marks and stuff. So um, it's addicting. And at any point, um, sorry, Scott, go ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah, I was just going to say, and that really, um, obviously, do the things you've done in your life takes a lot of drive, whether illegal or not illegal, um, to, to organize the things that you organize. Actually, you did two really impossible things at the same time, organizing your your uh, shipments, getting that done, and then organizing your racing, which 
you know, for most people, it would be hard to do one of them. And you were doing both at the same time. So obviously there's something in you that, that you're a highly driven individual. Uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, when, when we set goals to try to achieve things, uh, whether it's a short-term goal or a long-term goal, that's always a wonderful thing to achieve. But it, it's kind of, I've come to understand it's how we go about getting there now, not achieving the goals. And our right. journey's more about really how we go about getting to where we want to be at in life. So, yeah, I'm highly driven. Um, got a lot going on right now. As you mentioned it, I, it's crazy. I did all this time. They gave me a natural death sentence for selling marijuana in 1987, and it took me three decades to overcome it. I came out of prison after 27 years, and now the state of New Jersey awarded me a cultivation license uh, to cultivate marijuana and sell marijuana in the state of New Jersey. So I'm, I'm like super blessed. I'm full circle, I'm driving, instructing in race cars when I can. I have the opportunity, and now I'm back in the cannabis industry. Oh, well, that's just. I mean, that's just absolutely amazing because, I mean, you went, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you know, you, you went to prison for something and now you're basically, I mean, in a way you can almost do the same thing, but in a legal sense, and it's completely illegal. Um, it just shows how much, you know, things have, things have changed, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's bizarre and, and real ironic that, uh, but I'm glad to see that some of these states are paying it forward. Uh, what they call, I got, I received what's called a social equity license. That's being impacted by the war on drugs. And this war on drugs, for real, uh, Aaron and Scott, it, it, it's a war on citizens. Um, to lock up people for a plant that is a plant that heals, and not only does it heal the people, it actually helps heal the planet just by taking carbon dioxide out of the air. So it, Education goes a long ways, and I'm an advocate now for the cannabis prisoners. We have 176 of them, and I have a nonprofit organization called freedomgrow.org. I don't know if you've looked at it, but we are all about helping cannabis prisoners and their families because we believe no one should be locked up for this plant. So... Um... And, and I'm sure, you know, they, everyone appreciates that. I see, you know, I see posts on Instagram. Um, you're definitely um, very, very involved. And I think you, you were just speaking in Mississippi what, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I went out my first uh, keynote speaking opportunity in Biloxi, Mississippi's Coliseum and Convention Center and had a, a really great experience. Met some really wonderful people. Um, just really good stuff is happening. And they're freeing this plant up, uh, um, all about spreading the awareness that there's a lot of great people and families suffering due to the war on drugs and especially this plant, uh, the cannabis plant. And now 38 states, is, it's legal. And I myself got a license to cultivate it. And uh, well, I'm out looking for investors that want to get involved. Uh, got a book dropping on August the 2nd. I'm glad you finished it too, by the way. Yeah, there's probably, I mean, I know it hasn't been released yet, so I've, no. I've, I'm I've, honored that you sent me a book and I got to read it before anyone else has even started it, so. Right on. Well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I, uh, that you got to able to read it and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So one thing I thought was interesting, well, you, you, you know, you talk about um, when you, so when you were racing, you created that, um, like the water sports company or whatever to you know so you had like a legit business to kind of hide money from the irs or whatever yeah. um what like did people i mean did you know especially when you get an indy car i'm sure people would have a lot more questions like did other drivers or anyone ever say to you like how are you getting all this money like from water sports the, the drivers never questioned me i i some of the press asked me some questions and i of course laid it back on them about their water sports rentals and some real estate investments but um the the water sport jet ski and sailboat rental was just 
something that we enjoyed doing growing up here in South Florida. And it, it, it was generating a stream of income for us, but uh, it wasn't paying for no race cars. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Man, yeah. other people are probably thinking, man, I need I need to create a water sports business because he is making bank. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think you can rent that many jet skis unless you're like a MSO or multi-state operator. <laughs> that's uh it, that's one of those things where it, it would it'd be a nice, great life if only you didn't have to pay for the race cars. Oh boy, yeah, it'd be a whole lot more people involved, wouldn't it? Yeah, man, I'll tell you, those those uh, those race cars will make you make some bad decisions. They'll make you spend your money. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, it's it's an industry that you can't get enough of, uh, and you see from the mechanics to the to the flag waivers uh, at the tracks to the fans to the drivers to the team owners. It's 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 such a sport that it's just once you get yourself involved with it, it it's no turning back because it's it, it's a sport that really grabs your attention. You can't get out. You can't get out. I mean, there have been people who've made it out, but it's very few and far between. It's uh, it becomes your life, man. I I know from personal experience that at those small levels of racing I've done, and I I couldn't imagine if I had a chance to do Indy cars. Man, I, well, I'd, I'd, be, know, I'd be ankle deep, you know, waist deep, or wherever you want to put it. But I tell you, SCCA has a wonderful thing going on, and so does these um, these chump car racing events and stuff, where you got lower budget guys that are building their cars in the garages and in their in their sheds and so forth, and they're taking these cars with a lower budget and and having a a weekend with their family and stuff. There's nothing like it. it the camaraderie right. with these these lower budget teams and the amateur racing. I absolutely love it, and it was sad to see that my local track here in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach Speedway, just recently sold out to Walmart, and they're closing wow. it down. So that was sad to see that. Well, there's, there's a funny thing about those pit areas that are and paddocks areas whatever you want to call them is that everybody starts becoming on the same level you know that the, there's a you might be a hierarchy in life outside those gates but when you get inside those gates you know everybody's kind of the same and it you know you're not a you know if you're a an actor or a movie star outside of racing you know you come inside of there you're just another person and auto racing yeah. has a way of uh, humbling the humbling all those who are involved. Sure, you see celebrities coming into these races, uh, tracks that wanting to be a driver, and they're doing it out of that passion. And the ones that right. do it out of that passion go a lot further, such as Paul Newman. You see, he sure. he, he he really took it out to another level as a driver. And uh, he also had big success as an actor, but he was really, really a great driver. No, absolutely. Yeah. You know, the thing that I, I found uh, probably the most interesting was just how you were able to like, just balance, like, you know, being a smuggler, being a driver. And like, once you got in the car, you were able to kind of block everything out. And all you thought about was the racing. Um but besides the time where you realize you left a briefcase or whatever under a under a table in the restaurant and you came back <laughs> in, uh, I that was on the back straight stretch of the uh, L.A. Grand Prix out in Riverside back then, and um, I had yeah that was the story that's in the book. Uh, <laughs> I uh, a light bulb went off and I realized I left about fifty grand laying on the table in a little uh, a bag that goes around your belly like a little little right. money bag along with all my beepers and some some other stuff because I had just brought a load into Northern California. All right. Yeah, that's that's just crazy. Um so I'm um, obviously you know 84 you win the you know the IMSA um or the yeah, IMSA championship. And that kind of helped jumpstart, you know, the IndyCar stuff. 
Um, and I didn't realize that 85, you actually went to Indy for the rookie orientation program. Um, I never yeah. knew that. I've, I just thought you were just an Indy in 86. And then obviously um, you <laughs> stayed out under yellow. And they ended up, um, they ended up um, telling you how to leave or whatever. Um, but what, yeah. what yeah, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> that, that wasn't good. Uh, that humbled me big time. Uh, I was going down the, in 1985, I took the team to Indianapolis and was at rookie orientation running down the back straightaway. The lights come on before I entered, before I around the middle of the back straightaway, the yellow lights come on and I've got the very first pits exiting four. And we, we did that so we could get good, get good uh, tire temps readings. And the lights come on and no one's in front of me. So I stayed on the throttle. And I shoot down into uh, exit, uh, take pit, pit road and go to my pits and get, get tire temps. And uh, Chief Stewart comes out and asked me to get out the car. And we ended up having words because I didn't get off the throttle immediately when the yellow lights was coming on. But how I looked at it was there was nobody in front of me. So I'm just trying to get good tire temps. And I kind of said some things that I probably shouldn't have said. I, you know, I said, what the effing does that got to do with anything? No one's in front of me. And he didn't like my attitude, I guess. And I got uh, I got thrown out the track, the whole team. <laughs> so that didn't go over too good. I went and got uh, some rides in some um, formal Atlantic. And uh, won my second Formula Atlantic race in Washington State. Oh, didn't realize that. So then 86, obviously, you know, your first actual year at Indy, you made the race. Um, you know, just describe, like, what, what that feeling was like. Like you said, you know, you were a little kid dreaming of racing the Indy 500. And at this point, yeah. you made it. It, it was uh, phenomenal. The, the, uh, getting it done and... And getting it done in such a fashion, we, we, we broke Michael Andretti's record that's been setting for three years. And uh, just having the car hooked up to where it's running quite well and it's handling well, because um, I'd been there all month. Uh, it, it was just to get it over with and, and then to, to, to do a good job and because it, it's such a team effort. And the exuberance on all the team members' faces, and just it, it, the camaraderie that you have with the teammates and, and everybody at the track, and it, honestly, it, it, it's it's just great feeling and uh, exciting. And really, I think unfortunate for you. I mean, the walls are kind of closing in, so to speak, during the 500. Um, you know, that's what like a few months before you got you got busted end of '86. I got arrested at the end of 86 right. on a case that was out of Miami okay. uh, on a shrimp boat cases. And it wasn't the case that got me the life sentence. Right. That was a separate case. <clears throat> so I had two cases um, for smuggling marijuana, both of them. One was a shrimp boat charge out of Miami and the other was my loads that I did with tugboats and barges. So in May of 1986, the FBI was following me around and I had a load on the water. I had rerouted it back down through the Panama Canal and up to San Francisco. So yeah, the walls was closing in on me. Um, it wasn't a, even though I had done really well at Indianapolis, it was all coming unglued. I ended up uh, that year cutting a tie at Michigan 500, shattering my right femur bone with a double compound fracture. Mm -hmm. And so it was like one thing after another was coming in, the FBI, a crash. My wife was pregnant with twins. We lost one of the twins. My son was born January of 1987 without his brother. And seven days after he was born that's when i got indicted so it was a number of 
of things coming down the pathway. And right. look, we create our destiny. It's not that anybody said anything or, or ratted me out or any of that, because it all falls on me. You know, what <clears throat> we create our own destiny. And, um, you know, I just had to pay the piper to for the struggles and stuff that I'd caused many other people in my exploits of bringing in the, the marijuana. I've always heard people What's say there? like, so there, sorry, Scott. So there were FBI, no, like FBI, sorry. there were FBI guys at the track during the month of May, correct? Yeah. They was wherever I would go. <laughs> they were Except what? Oh. They were they were with me wherever I went. They was following me until I wanted to lose them, and it was quite easy to get to to lose the tail. But what I was saying earlier, like I just couldn't imagine that pressure of you know. I mean, there's enough pressure to drive at the 500. I mean, you know, your first year making the race and all that, and then on top of it, you have all of that kind of you know as a big weight on your shoulders. Yeah, it was. Um... It wasn't comfortable knowing that you're being watched and you're trying to always figure out who it is that's doing the watching. <laughs> so, you know, I'm looking around, I'm thinking, is this person or this person? And my wife's telling me I'm just being paranoid and so forth. But, um, you know, I, you try, I try to work through it and try to figure it out that I had been negotiating with the district attorney's office wanting to cut a deal if I could but they was offering uh, they initially offered me 18 years complete forfeiture and complete cooperation so I shot back with 20 years complete forfeiture no cooperation and they didn't accept that so with it, with that all summer long uh, we was negotiating trying to come to terms so I could turn myself in and turn over all my funds that I received. But I also wasn't trying to spend 20 or 30 years in prison. Right. Or tell on anybody. I didn't want to tell on anybody. Sure. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. They, those, those types of people don't appreciate that very often <laughs> when you, when you start telling on them. Yeah, um, at my mind frame was at the time I didn't want anyone to have to go through what I was going through and families because right. you not only sure. lock up the person that is involved in the cannabis space, but their families have to go through a lot of trauma and, and pain and suffering along with them. Sorry, yeah, Scott, I, I didn't did. mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, you're fine. I, I just find it, um, again, I go back to it, just juggling all of that. And, and here it's all coming at the same time as, uh, as your, your, I wouldn't say it's your complete dream, but as the major portion of your dream is coming true, uh, running the speedway and, and competing in, you know, competing in Indy cars full time. And, and then, you know, it's all, you know, I'm sure you knew it was all kind of starting to come to an end at the time it was really taking off. Yeah, it was short lived. Uh, boy, do I wish I could have had more time <laughs> in the IndyCar series. I wanted to win Indy uh, 500. That was like uh, one of my goals. But you know what? Just to compete there and run there and, and having the success in the race cars that I did, I'm really blessed to have had the life that I had, even though it's spent 27 years in cages uh, in the federal prison system, but it's over it's behind me now. And I am just so blessed to be here speaking to you guys and, and my freedom and my family is so important that uh, I, you know, I, I don't look back on it with regrets, uh, maybe some remorse for making some choices that I made that led to this predicament that I got myself in. Right. And um, <clears throat> so, so you talk, everyone kind of knows the story about when, when you got busted. I mean, it's almost like something from a movie, right? You're on the boat, you get on the, um, like the, 
the little whatever you call it, the little boat and you, you you're running up on the thing and they chase you. I mean, at that point, when you actually get busted, I mean, you'd been on the run for what a few months at that point. Like, do you, you always hear people say, like, when people get caught, they actually feel like some kind of relief. Like, did you feel any type of relief at all? <laughs> I didn't feel no relief at the time. I, I felt, uh, I felt like I was caught up in a nightmare. And um, I got arrested in Antigua on an island. And, and they put me, when they brought me, to the jail house or courthouse, they put me in a closet because they didn't really have a cells at where they were at on this island. So they put me in a closet without light. So I stayed there all night. <laughs> and the next day they brought me out and put me in a room and told me they was kicking me off as an undesirable. So I thought, oh boy, it gave me hope. Like they just kicked me off the island. But that wasn't, <laughs> That wasn't the story. They brought me in shackles and chains to the airport, and they um, announced uh, the flight. They told me they was kicking me off and put me on a plane to St. Martin. So I go to get up on the plane, and as soon as I they walked me to the tarmac to the plane, FBI agent standing at the door with his FBI card, him and his partner, and they go, FBI agent, this is considered American soil. And you're under arrest. So they take me, put me in a seat. Next thing I know, they're making an announcement that the plane was being diverted from Antigua to St. Martin to Antigua and Puerto Rico, the closest American territory. And if anybody wanted to get off, disembark now. But if they stayed, American Airlines would give them a round trip ticket to any destination they flew to. Not a person got off the plane. Everybody stayed with <laughs> Puerto Rico. <laughs> uh. wow um and so you know obviously you know you're in prison for 27 years you know talk about i mean what's the first thing you do when you get released from a federal prison for 27 years first thing i did was hug my family that picked me up and then we drove to my mother's house where she had made me some a breakfast and just amazing um having the freedom and you know to sit and kick it kick it and laugh with your family in the living room and walk yeah. outside and listen to the birds and see the trees and the flowers in the 1990s they cut down all the trees in the maximum security penitentiaries where I, which I was being housed at so to, in order to see a tree like in Leavenworth we had to climb up bleachers and look over a 40 foot wall and the trees was miles in the background. And that was as close as we could get to a tree. And I became, I'm a tree loving nut now. I love trees. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a reason why they remove the trees like that? Yeah, someone, they found someone up in a tree one time and they oh. just uh, <laughs> said, no, too much of a, a place where they could hide or something. So they took them all out of the maximum security prisons. Right. So um, obviously, so January of this year, I actually met you for the first time at Daytona. Um, so talk a little bit about like what, what it was like kind of going back. I don't, I mean, you, I know you were at Daytona what, a few years ago as well. I think it was your first time back. Um, yeah. The to, to the 24 hours of Daytona. Yeah. I had been back prior uh, in some race cars, uh, a, a driving instructor for right. a, um, a Corvette school here in Florida. And um, that was pretty awesome to to go back and instruct at these tracks and to go back and hang out with Chip Ganassi. That's my buddy from my IndyCar series days in IMSA and um, seeing what he's doing and hanging out with some buddies and seeing friends from 30 some years ago and just being around the smell and the sounds and the noise and the whole atmosphere is just really felt good. Oh, I'm sure. And then obviously this year, you know, your first time back at Indy in what, 30 something years, 30, or 36 years, I think. 36 uh, last, years. Yeah. So what, what was your thoughts? I mean, 36 years later, like I'm, I mean, gasoline alley pretty much looks the same, right. From when you were there, um, but everything else is probably a lot different than what you remember. Yeah, it's built out a lot. 
um, a lot of the back behind Gasoline Alley for the fans and stuff. They didn't have all that. And it, it just built out really good. And I got to tell you, the the president of the Speedway and everybody related to the Speedway just really looked out for me. Uh, I was really taken back to uh, how everybody was congenial and nice and really respectful. And, um, you know, I figured I might be a, a black sheep of the family, but I wasn't treated as such. And going back to the Indianapolis, I was treated with open arms. No, absolutely. Yeah, we saw you on. I was with my buddy Caleb and we had like a 30 minute conversation with you. on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it was on Carb Day. But um, yeah, and I mean, you were participating in the autograph session and it seemed like, you know, a lot of fans had stuff for you to sign. And I heard on race day, you were actually getting autographs yourself. Yeah, I was uh, was getting some autographs for my son. Okay, cool. So, yeah, yeah, man. So, uh, you know, well, everybody loves these guys. And so I wanted to get some autogra autographs and give to my son. All right, no, that's cool. By the way, I just I mentioned my son was a twin and we lost one of his brothers. I, I come out of prison <clears throat> in 2014 and in 2015, my son's girlfriend has twins. So now I'm a grandfather oh, wow. of two six-year-old uh, boys. Well, we, congratulations. We just, yeah, thanks. We just took him to Lego for four days, uh, Legoland, and we just absolutely had a thrilling time. Oh, wow. So I, I know for a while when you got out of prison, like you were on like probation and stuff. Like, do you have any limitations now, like where you go or anything like that? No, I'm good. I'm off paper. I can travel, oh, wow. come and go wherever I want to go. Um, don't have to answer to any any officers anymore for <clears throat> what is crazy. When I first went in for 18 years, they they made me what's called a high accountable inmate. And that they gave me a, a, a orange card about the size of your hand. They wanted me to wear it around my neck, but I kept it in my pocket most of the time. <clears throat> and you're supposed to wear this card around your neck. It's bright orange with your number and a photo. And every two hours on the weekdays, every one hour on the weekends, every one hour after 4 p.m., and every one hour on the holidays, I had to find an officer and report into him and show him my card and ask him to call the control unit because I'm a high accountability. I was a, what's called a high escape risk. So that went on for 18 years. And when they finally lowered my custody, I felt like something in the back of my head kept telling me I'm missing something. It was the weirdest feeling. And I, I know you were talking about, and I've heard you on po other podcasts and stuff talking about like, you know, trying to escape. Like, I know you you had plans to escape, but did you ever actually try to execute any of them? No, I never did. Never got the chance to. Uh, I was a dreamer. <laughs> right, sure. I'm, I got, I, I have uh, high hopes, maybe. Optimistic always, no matter what situation. <laughs> and this is really one of the things that we all have within us. We have, all of us on this planet, we have the capability and the capacity to be the observer of our own thoughts and our emotions. And with that, we can sit and kind of look at our situation and figure out what would be the best way to get ourselves or change the situation or circumstance that we're in. And one of the other capabilities we have is we have the capability of changing any experience in life no matter what situation, what circumstance, whether it's a struggle, a hardship, financial, emotional, we have the ability, the capability to change that experience. And it's really simple. All you have to do is change your perspective towards the situation or circumstance and you'll change your experience. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, you know, that always, that reminds me of the Eagles lyric where uh, he says, uh, so oftentimes it happens. You live your life in chains, never knowing that you have the key. And I think yeah, that is... Bro, uh, you're right. Look, it's all within us. I think that's us. perfect. And, and, and it's yeah. all within us. I, uh, 
on a long lockdown out of 27 years, I spent seven years in solitary confinement. And wow. the longest I spent in a, in a cell, solitary confinement was two years. And within them two years, I did a lot of meditation, a lot of contemplation. And I came to understand that if the door is never open and I'm in this seven by 10 foot cell the rest of my life, I'm okay because I can do my push-ups. I can do my meditation. I'm really blessed because I'm learning how to play chess blindfolded without right. seeing the board. It's crazy because how we perceive a situation or circumstances, we create our experience. And I developed an understanding of how to create a great experience in any situation or circumstance. And what was it that you actually did to get put in solitary confinement? Well, when I would plot to try to figure out how to get myself out, whether it was through the courts or not through the courts, um, somebody that it, it, you'd always have to, it seemed like I needed help. So I would maybe take my time and trust somebody and somehow somebody would say something to somebody else. Right. And they would end up writing what call you kites to the lieutenant's office that, hey, I'm trying, I, I have an escape plot going on. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> Wow. And that's it could pretty... be simple thing as, as a word that's on the phone. If you're talking to someone on the phone, uh, you know, if they contrive something. One time I used somebody's phone. I didn't want to get on the phone with my phone because I had to call a, a person that was a helicopter pilot. So I used someone else's phone and I got locked up for using somebody else's phone and that created a an investigation. Now, the helicopter pilot was part of your escape plan, right? At that time, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's you gotta dream big. You gotta dream big. Look, I'm an optimist. <laughs> right. Well, well, the only other question I have for you, Randy, is um, you know, I know you you say you're doing, you know, some driving instructing. Like, is there any like racing or anything you've thought about trying? I mean, because there's so many forms, I mean, SCCA. There's so many other yeah. forms of racing now that, you know, you could probably. Yeah, do. I'm not, do not doing any racing right now. Uh, I did a couple. I did five races since I've been out. I've been out for seven years. I've taken two seconds, uh, a fourth, and two DNFs. Hmm. And um, right now, all of my attention is going to New Jersey because I've gotten a cultivation license. My attention was on this right here. Yep. All right. So uh, writing a book, Survival of the Fastest, got that done. That's coming out August the 2nd. And um, next, I, I just signed a deal with the book. It's going to turn into a full feature film. So that's a blessing in itself right there. Wow. No, that's amazing. Uh, and how long did it take you to write the book? Took me about eight months. And uh, most of my energy, I told you about going to New Jersey, but I'm also really focused on freedomgrow.org, mm -hmm, which is an sure. all-volunteer, nonprofit organization that helps cannabis prisoners and their families. And if you're interested in the cannabis space at all, please check us out, freedomgrow.org. Oh, absolutely. Um, Scott, you have any other questions? Uh, not really. I, I just, you know, like I said before, I, I mean, I illegal or not man it, the to do to be able to organize what you organize i mean that you know that's what ceos of major corporations do i you know it's amazing focus you have and, and to do that at the same time as being a high level race car driver and, and that's something i think that is forgotten is that you were uh, a very high level race car driver you didn't get a chance to race very long but you you did a lot in the career that you had yeah, and, thank you, Scott. <laughs> uh, and I just, uh, you know, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank, uh, you. thank you so much for coming on. Look for more coming out uh, with the book, Survival of the Fastest, coming out August the 2nd. And I appreciate you for having me on and having this platform to talk about racing. And where can they, where, where can people buy the book? 
Oh, the book's available. At, you can pre-order it at Amazon.com, and it's available August the second at Barnes and Noble. And are you going to be doing any book signings? Yes, I am. I haven't got dates. So my next date that I'm doing something is I doing Dale Onhard's podcast on August the second. Oh wow! And that that'll be on Peacock TV August the fourth. Cool. So you'll be going to Charlotte for that then? I'm going to Mooresville. Yes. The um, yeah. well, hopefully you can get to India and do a book signing here because I'm sure the fans here would really enjoy that. Yeah, I, maybe I'll talk to um, IMS about that. That's a good idea. Yeah, because I know when Paul Page had his book, he I think he signed in the in the gift shop there in the museum. So nice, nice. Maybe they could sell the book, your book, in the yeah, museum. I, th- or yeah, yeah. I'm going to put some books up at IMS. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and like I said, you know, it's it's been great. I've I've met you a couple times now, so it's always you know great to see you the track. And I'm sure I'll I'll be at Daytona again next year, and um, of course, I'll Indy. Be there. So, all yeah. right, I'll see. I'll, I'll be back at Indy. Cool. Yeah. Well. Um. Yeah. It looked like you enjoyed yourself. So. Oh uh, yeah, I loved it. Okay. All right. Well, Randy. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. You're welcome and, uh, on, Scott. Nice. You guys be well. Godspeed. All right. Thanks. Hey, you too, Randy. And thank you so much again. And uh, just uh, best wishes. Take care. Thank you, sir. Enjoy.